To all of you who are watching today, uh, welcome. Our session this afternoon will be on the Professional Directors Program and our presenter today will be Vicki Dixon. Uh, Vicki holds an honors degree in microbiology, an advanced diploma in human resource management from the Rotman School of Management, and recently graduated as a professional director. As a senior associate of the Professional Director Program, she supports the lead consultants in enhancing corporate and individual performance through business transformation, operational improvements, training development, and project management excellence. The Professional Directors Program is ran through Governance Solutions Organization. It currently poses as a resource for rural and remote citizens to build comprehensive leadership skills that will enhance their abilities within the boardroom setting um, so that they can make changes within their hometown on a policy level. So as, as Nicole mentioned, I work for a company called Governance Solutions and we're based in Ontario and they've actually been in business for almost 35 years. The principals are Dr. Deborah Brown and David Brown, husband and life partners, work partners and life partners. And together, uh, globally, they have actually impacted the governance of many boards, corporate, not-for-profit, governments, et cetera, in really bringing good governance practices to bear. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about getting ready to make fast, wise boardroom decisions. And I think the really key part about this is it's not enough to be fast. Our whole world is so quick and so fast but it's not enough to just be fast, we have to be wise. So let's take a look at that now. Um, they did some survey data with uh, another webinar that we did and they asked this, the audience this question, would it be unreasonable to expect someone to be trained to do their job? So no surprise, 94% expect people to be trained on how to do their job. But interestingly, when it, when they ask the same question, is it unreasonable to expect that leaders be trained to do their job? The number actually dropped down, which really begs the question, why, why is that? Why would we not expect leaders to also be trained on how to do their job, which is to lead? And similarly, when it came to asking about board members or board directors, should they be trained to do their job? It was a similar number, around 84%. So, it's really an interesting trend that although all of us are expected to be trained on how to do our work, some people be or leaders should be trained to do theirs. And that's where we would beg to differ. And I'm going to uh, go through with through today a little bit about good governance and what that looks like and why it's important. So why do you suppose what do you suppose is a key factor for making fast and wise decisions? Well, it really boils down to training. Everyone, each of us, needs to be educated to know what we're doing. We don't wake up just knowing exactly what to do in every single role that we play in life. So this training is really, really key. So I pose a question. Question, what do you suppose the number one governance challenge in the boardroom is? So imagine that you're in the boardroom and you're actually one of the directors. What's the number one governance challenge? Is the fact that you need to know what you're doing. The number one mistake and the number one failure in certain boards is the board members end up trying to do the job of management or and or management ends up trying to do the job of the board. And there's this bright line that exists between both. And if you don't know which side of the line you're supposed to be sitting on, then there's some education that's been missing. And that's really, really vital to being a very successful board. That clarity on who does what. So what is governance? Governance is the system by which organizations or associations or municipal government, you can extend it across all of them, are directed and controlled, the system by which they are directed and controlled. So board of directors are absolutely 100% responsible for the governance of their organization or their association. So I'd like to draw the analogy of a, of a large cruise ship because really what's happening in a situation of good governance is the board of directors is acting as the rudder of the ship so they set the direction and they ensure that the ship makes its destination. But they don't get into 
what's being served for dinner that night or what activities are being offered on the Lido deck. That is management and they're responsible for all of that. But the board of the directors is actually responsible for the rudder, set the direction and ensure it reaches the destination. So a board member's fiduciary responsibility is really to act honestly in good faith and in the best interest of the organization to exercise care, diligence, and skill of a re reasonably prudent person and to comply with any legal requirements. So how does that perhaps impact you and um, your future as a potential board member? Too often I see in rural, certainly I can speak for rural Ontario, I see uh, people stepping up they're flattered to be asked to join a board, even if it's a volunteer board and not a pay, paying role. They're very flattered to be invited to join the board and they step into that role without good orientation or onboarding or education on what their fiduciary responsibilities are. And they're significant. There's significant risk to you as an individual. There's significant risk as a board and knowing and understanding what you can, um, what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for is really, really paramount. So um, the program we're gonna talk about in a couple of minutes was developed for exactly that reason and that purpose for rural leaders across the country so that they can fully understand what happens when they step into a board position. So there are five key elements to good direction and good control. On the left-hand side, we have direction. And on the right-hand side, we have control. And I'm just going to take a moment and speak really briefly to each of these. And um, if I do motivate you to actually take the course, um, then uh, obviously these will be expanded on. And there's so much behind each of them. So I'm just going to touch on them today. So let's start with the first one, which is setting direction, strategy direction, and making sure you get to your destination, which is strategy control. So the strategic plan is owned by the board of directors. They're responsible for the strategic plan. Doesn't mean that they don't invite management to participate or provide input or research data, etc. But the board of directors owns that strategic plan annually and they also own the annual report, which is the report on how close you came to reaching your destination. So that belongs to the board of directors. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna post a poll, hopefully, if this works the way we want. A fellow board member, we'd love your input on this. A fellow board member feels very strongly about prioritizing a project. You feel strongly that it's not a priority, nor is it in the strategic plan. What do you do? So take a look at each of those. I'm gonna to try to move it off my screen so that I can see it. <laughs> Wonder how I do that, Nicole? Right over the, yeah, uh, I'll read it from here. Number one, a fellow board member feels strongly about prioritizing project. You feel strongly that it's not a priority, it's not in the plan, do you shut them down? Do you talk to them offline? Do you talk to other board members offline during a break, express your view directly or say nothing? So we can end the poll and share the results. Thank you. It's great having this help. There you can see 100% felt you should express your view directly during the board agenda item and encourage a focus back on the agreed upon strategic priorities. That's exactly right. Okay, we can stop sharing, there we go. Okay, so let's talk about the second element in good governance, which is performance and risk direction. So in performance risk direction, you're actually testing the risk tolerance or the risk appetite for the organization or the association. So there's a lot of energy that goes in by a board to talk about obstacles, what's ahead of us, as well as opportunities, what might we face 
that's going to impact our ability to reach our destination. And what are we going to do about it? So to control for risk, they'll often take things on like scorecards, enhanced reporting, where they used to get a report once a year or once every six months. They actually, once they, for example, COVID, where they're very worried about the impact on the organization. A lot of them move to once a month reporting. They might uh, adopt things like heat maps in order to uh, measure their own risk tolerance. These are elements of risk direction and risk control. So let's try another poll. The board is slow to act in making decisions that have some urgency. What do you do? Do nothing and be patient. Send an email to the board members explaining the urgency. Press the board to make decisions quickly. Delegate more authority to management. Have a subset of the board form a committee. What do you think? Okay, we're sort of split on this one. Some think send an email. Oh, three, do we have everyone? Send an email to the board members explaining the urgency. At board meetings, press the board to make a decision and delegate management for decision making. An actual fact is actually uh, pressing the board uh, professionally to make decisions quickly um, at the board meetings. But not, it is not incorrect to send an email to the board members explaining the urgency. That kind of communication is important also. Uh, delegating more authority to management for decision making. This is where you can be, have to be very cautious because you might actually be crossing that line where management starts doing uh, things that the board's responsible for and the board ends up doing things that management's respons responsible for. So that's a, a bit of a cautionary tale, that one. Be cautious about delegating authority to management. Make sure if it's a direction and control item that it remains with the board. Interestingly, often the committee, the last choice, is the one that's selected, form a subset and form a committee. And again, that's not um, recommended too much um, removal from the board directly into committee work. They lose control. They're, they're not as visible to what's happening. And so that's not recommended. Okay. The the third one, people direction. So this is an interesting one because the board of directors has a single employee and that single employee is the CEO or the general manager or the president, whatever name that they give, uh, the person responsible for the operations of the organization or the association. That's the only person that the board of directors is directly responsible for. Everyone else falls under human resources, which is a, an operational piece of your organization. So in people direction, a good board with good governance has very clear job descriptions, performance goals and metrics, performance mandate. They have a clear delineation of who does what and how. They have communication protocols about who can speak to what and when and where. And then they control that through evaluation. They don't get into the day-to-day -day of running of the company. They don't get into the business of the human resources department or, or this chief financial officer uh, in, in managing the people of the organization. They leave that to the, the heads of the various groups in the organization and they stay focused on the CEO. So let's take a look at this poll. The board is meeting and didn't include the CEO or executive director. What do you think about that? They should be at every board meeting. It'd be better if they were there, but not necessary. They must be there to lead the meeting. They should be an integral part participant in every board meeting. And I'm fine, boards can meet without them. What do you think? Great, yes, 100%. They're an integral participant in every board meeting whenever possible, and they should be included and not excluded. Dysfunctional boards uh, and dysfunctional companies are when there is that animosity between the executive director or the CEO and the board, and they're um, 
alienated and, and not included. That's where you really see dysfunctionality. The highest performing boards have a very professional, very close working relationship with their CEO. If in fact there are things that the board needs to discuss and the CEO can't be privy, and there aren't very many things like that other than perhaps their annual appraisal ahead of time, you know, if they want to review what's been written up, they would go in camera and ask the uh, CEO to step out. And other than that, in a good working relationship, your CEO will be included throughout. Okay. So policy direction is the fourth. And this is very specific to board and governance related policies. What are the boundaries and the guidelines? This direct, this bright line I've spoken about, about who does what, what's our mandate, what isn't our mandate, who goes where. The control side of that is audited minutes, audited reports, audited financials to see how well these policies are directing and controlling the organization. They don't get into the policy work that, again, happens typically within your human resources department, for example. That's not their mandate, so they stay very focused on governance-type governance, governance type policies, which are all about direction and control. Let's try the next poll. A board member is acting individually and instructing the CEO and staff outside of meetings. What do you think about this one? You think it's okay? Put a policy in place, explaining when they can, adopt a communication protocol, tell them to stop, instruct the CEO, director, and staff to do what the board members tell them to. What do you think? This is kind of a tricky one because they're both right. There absolutely should be a communication protocol that defines what a board member can speak, who they can speak to when they're speaking on behalf of the board. Uh, same when it comes to the media or the press, really important that a board have a strong communication protocol about what you're allowed to speak about, what, who you're allowed to speak to and who will do the speaking. Often there is a, a designated person in the organization that does the speaking, so a board member shouldn't be doing it at all. However, having said that, it's up to the chair. If they have a board member who is stepping outside of the expectations of the entire board, like going directly to staff, that the chair is responsible for speaking to them, ideally outside of the meeting as a one-off, and getting them to um, sort of reiterate what, what the policy is and ask them to, um, to adhere by that. This is very common um, in volunteer boards. When you have a not-for-profit, uh, your volunteer board members are wanting to be hands-on. They want to fundraise. They want to help run events. They want to help with press and media. Um, it's just, it's one of the reasons they've stepped up to be a board member is because they feel passionately about the association. Therefore, their energy extends past the board meeting. And that's challenging because there's an operational team, a, a staff that's been hired to do this work. And too many cooks in the kitchen can really uh, cause some havoc. So it's very important that uh, board members as part of their orientation and onboarding to becoming a good board member, understand what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. Close that one out, which brings us to our last one, which is resources, money. So the board of directors is absolutely responsible for the budget, what can be spent, what can't be spent, the business plan that drives that budget. They need to fully uh, invest in how they will resource what needs to be accomplished for that year. And they control that a variety of ways, but typically through quarterly financial statements and by their CEO or CFO attending board meetings and keeping them very up to speed 
very up to date on how you're tracking versus budget. So this is a, a key responsibility. And when you're running, if you're a board member on a large corporation with shareholders, this has to be so strictly controlled because it's impacting stock share price. It can impact the selling price of a company when it's sold. Um, you just have to think back to even how long is ago, 10, 12 years where the Enron people ended up in prison, uh, largely because they were not paying attention to the financials and really were in there for their own purposes as opposed to the good of the organization. So this is a really key responsibility and one I find new directors often are um, unfamiliar with and get a little bit over their head when they join, join a board without the proper education. So let's try one last poll. A board member who's also volunteers trying to control where the money's been spent, regardless of the approved budget and strategy, what should the chair do? Remind the board about the difference between put policy in place, change the budget to match, match the wishes, remind the board member of the role, or let the board member do what they want. What do you think? I'm getting a bit of a split on this one. Yeah, they're all right. Remind them about the difference between being a volunteer and being a board member. And again, this often goes right back to the beginning, good onboarding and orientation to being a member of the board, making sure the policy is in place to clarify roles. So there should be terms of reference for everyone on that board and what they can do and what they can't do. And then remind the board member of the role of the board in financial oversight. They shouldn't be in the kitchen. Let the management, um, once the budget's been approved and it's been passed over to the CEO, the CEO is responsible for running the company. And uh, that's where um, the buck stops. It really, really stops there. And the board member needs to remain in the boardroom. So that gives you just a really quick overview of what good governance is all about. Um, the term governance gets bantied around a lot, and it really falls back to that very basic definition that I mentioned at the beginning. It's about direction and control. So you don't get just what you plan. You get what you resource, you get what you measure, and you get what you reward. And all of those are going to result in a, a successful organization going forward. So I spoke earlier about education, and if you were searching for director certification, there are a few out there. Uh, there's the Chartered Director School, there's ICDC, and there's also what's known as Professional Director, which is the one that's offered by Government Solutions. Regardless of which one you choose, it's really uh, becoming almost a best practice for you to have some sort of certification be before you become a board member. Not all boards will ask for it, but more and more the good boards, the successful boards, are moving to competency-based board uh, member selection, and one of the skills they look for is governance education. So it is something to think about if you have in your own plans going forward uh, a, a future opportunity of becoming a member of a board. Do consider director certification. So the professional director program has been out for a number of years uh, in both an online and live format. And it's gone through a whole, since COVID, a whole reworking of the program. And uh, uh, it's very current and very up to date. Um, and it's probably the most extensive director education uh, typically taught by Dr. Deborah Brown and David Brown. The interesting thing is we've made um, a, uh, a modification to this program specifically for rural leaders like yourselves. And um, it started a couple of years ago with a Canadian Agricultural Partnership grant and um, 
Ontario Minis uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Rural and Rural Affairs grant to start to build a governance education program that is specific to rural leaders. So we offer the full professional director program, which can take up to six months to do. And then there's the professional director rural leaders that has had a lot of the content adapted and um, modified specifically for rural, rural Canada, rural, rural anywhere, uh, is broken down into eight levels. And each one is a standalone module. Each one has uh, video, approximately 20 to 30 minutes of video. There's reading. There's a quiz at the end of each one. And successful completion of all eight uh, results in the Professional Director World Leader Certificate. So it is a certificate program. It's something that can be added to your resume. And it's something that can be broadcasted when you apply to boards of director positions. So level one is governance essentials, which I just gave you, you know, sort of five minutes worth uh, when we talked about the five strategies for good governance. There's guarding the vision and build, building the structure, knowing your role, leading the way, boardroom culture and behavior, financial oversight, which is very, very good. Uh, especially if you don't come as I didn't with a financial background, it's very good learning. Six is all about people, getting the right people doing the right things. Seven is about strategy and risk. And eight is succession and evaluation. So as I mentioned, each of these is a standalone module. Completion of all eight and you become a Proder RL. Here's just a couple quotes, uh, one from the Federal Agriculture and Agri-Food Minister at the time, Canada's youth play a critical role in the continued growth and prosperity of the ag sector. Our government is proud to support projects such as this certification program that provide young farmers with the tools and know-how to become effective leaders. And Ernie Hardiman, the former Minister of Agriculture in Ontario, our government is committed to removing barriers for our agri-food sector so it can grow and be more competitive in the global marketplace. So they were both, uh, both groups very supportive in the building of this program. Other resources that exist, uh, Dr. Deborah Brown and David Brown are prolific writers. So uh, their original book, which is Governance Solution, The Ultimate Guide to Competence and Confidence is a very hefty, probably 600 or 700 page guide to good governance. Um, it's really incorporates everything that you would ever need. There's also um, more recently, uh, very popular books that they've brought out virtually there. It's all about running virtual board meetings and annual, annual general meetings, which obviously all of us transitioned to this year. Uh, Governing in Scary Times which is the, board, the board's roadmap for governing through an emergency like COVID. And then their most recent book is ESG Matters, Environmental Social Governance, which we didn't touch on today, but it's becoming an absolute must have for organizations and associations, which is good governance around the environmental and social issues that face the company going forward or the association going forward and companies who are not paying attention to ESG are actually seeing it impacting their stock price and their share price. So this is something that everyone expects uh, a, an organization or a corporation to have, which is environmental social governance. So these are also good books, all of them available on Amazon if you're interested. Another resource that we offer is free Tuesdays. Every second Tuesday, there is a free education session and uh, similarly to the ones you're hosting, they're posted online after the event, they're recorded and posted online, typically a half an hour of topic and a half an hour of Q&A. So a format you're familiar with. Topics vary uh, from one end of the spectrum to another. Um, they get into all sorts of diversity topics and discrimination bias and how to avoid it and how to choose a chair and um, what to do with disruptive board members, you know, all sorts of very hands-on practical topics, uh, financial governance, uh, the list is endless, but if you're interested, 
visit governancesolutions.ca and you'll see uh, every other Tuesday and you're more than welcome to join us at any time. And that brings me to the end of my talk and I'll turn it over to Nicole, see if we have any questions. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us today, Vicki. Um, you can unshare your screen if you're interested and leave your video on and we can um, go through the questions that way. Um, yeah, again, I think especially going through those different examples, uh, it's becoming so clear that these issues come up all the time and different types of dynamics that may arise within, you know, different boardroom settings. And I think that it's a really important program uh, to consider for anyone who does want to kind of step into a policy role to assist mm -hmm. with community development. Yes. Um, so of all the people applying to be um, a part of this certificate program, um, is it known how many are already on boards while they apply or how many are taking it prematurely so that they can be prepared? Specifically for professional director or professional director RL? Um, either or. Yeah, well, professional directors RL is newer, so I don't think we'd have good data on that. Um, my gut would tell me it's probably uh, newer people considering boards. Professional director, uh, gosh, I don't have the statistic, but I've attended so many of the teaching sessions. I would say probably uh, 70 or 80 percent of them are on boards and want to get sort of caught up with current education, current trends. Um, they may have some underlying concerns about not being properly onboarded or educated when they accepted the position. Uh, even large utilities are sending people from their boards to us to be, go through it as a cohort. They'll go through it together, one company or one utility all together so that they can all be educated at the same time. Uh, it's very big in uh, credit unions and banks, regulators like the nursing profession, dentistry. Uh, a lot of the regulators are asking their people to be certified as well. So I would say it's fairly high for you're in the role now and need to be caught up quickly. <laughs> That's probably would be my yeah, guess. Absolutely. And well, even too, just the, the slide that you had showed um, earlier on in the presentation about the expectations for leaders being educated. That was relatively shocking to see that there was such a jump between someone applying for a job and someone applying for a leadership role. Because I think too, especially when you are in a leadership position, you know, like you should have some, some fundamental grounding on your skills within that setting, but it's not as expected, which was really interesting and shocking. It is shocking. It is shocking. To, absolutely. I mean, should you be a leader just as a, because you've spent 20 years doing something? No. I mean, your, your impact on people can be so profound, but uh, in a negative way, as well as a positive way, that to not provide leaders with good training and good education, even outside of the boardroom. I mean, leaders, and I've, I've certainly been in organizations in my career where how did this person become the boss? <laughs> you're, you're sort of left going, how did this person became, become the boss? And it was maybe because they've been there the longest. And it yeah. just is, that's, that's not what it's about. And uh, good, good learning, good education. Uh, I do a lot of recruitment. And I, one of the number one things that good employers are looking for are people who uh, embrace continuous learning. And on their resume, it shows sort of a roadmap of what they're continuing to learn about, even diverse topics like going from good governance to, you know, uh, personality, uh, online personality profile testing. You know, you can have that whole disparity between what you're learning, but the fact that an individual is open to learning is something that employers want to see on the resume now. It's not yeah. just get educated once and then work for 20 years and become a boss. <laughs> Those days are gone. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think too, especially with, you know, the last two years in COVID, it's shown very clearly, you know, when someone is interested in continuous learning, it's a little bit easier of a transition when you ha are faced with these, you know, um, structure kind of shifting situations. Yeah. So yeah. 
Well, we all had, many of us had the opportunity to do more learning. I mean, that's when I did my professional director certification, actually, COVID hit, and uh, I kicked it off right away um, in order to, because it does take, you know, four to six months when you do it alone online, um, which is sometimes a little tougher. They do offer live cohort for those of us who like to be with others, but uh, it does, you know, when you're on your own, it takes a little longer. So COVID presented that opportunity of having sort of uninterrupted two or three hours a day that you could devote to something like that, yeah. which is good. Um, and that actually leads me perfectly to my next question. Um, because there are the three different um, methods of taking this certification program, it's the individual at your own pace online, um, and then there was the in-person cohort and the online cohort. Well, they have, um, for ProDure itself, there is uh, an in-class version where you come together with others from other companies or universities or wherever, or you decide to do self-study and you do it online. It's completely online. Uh, for rural leadership, the professional director for rural leaders, that's completely online. There's not a live version. And it would take probably a couple hours, I would say, per module to, to work through the, re the readings, uh, watch the video, and do the quiz. And then you'd be ready to move on to module two, module three. And each of them is priced separately as well. So there's all, they're completely standalone. But right now we don't offer a group or live cohort for rural leadership. Um, has there been an increase in interest in this program um, since COVID has started in relative to prior when we were in person and it was more of a communication in the workplace rather than emails and Zoom meetings. Yeah, and... well, last year, you know, it was interesting because uh, everyone was so frightened what would happen to organizations with, with COVID and all of us being at home, but it actually presented a really um, good environment for government solutions because so much of their work was being built already online and we were having trouble shifting people to online. They still wanted us, to, they wanted us to fly in and do it for four days in person. When that all shut down, um, the free Tuesday started and, you know, we get upwards now 350 people or 400 people at the, every other Tuesday and that audience now says, okay, now I've done this, I'm going to move into the actual course and start my, start my certification. I'm now convinced, you know, they've heard the topics on Tuesdays and so they're now convinced. So uh, last year was a really good year for professional director. A lot of people use the time to get caught up, get certified. There's an ongoing continuous education as well that's required to keep your certification. So those that are already professional directors have to maintain that des designation through reading and learning and attending webinars like this. And yeah. So and it, yeah, and it's like you said, it's just, it's not something that's a standalone, right? It's something right. that is constantly changing and evolving as we go through. And yeah, and I think, especially within the next couple of years, as we kind of all recoup in terms of organization and, and business development, um, how we're going to be approaching and looking at these new environments or these work mm -hmm. environments and situations. Uh, for me, I, the part that surprised, really surprised me two years ago when we started to build the Rural Leaders program was, was, and it was a point I mentioned in my talk, was how many leaders, board members, younger board members especially, and especially rural Ontario, because I was working for a rural um, association and I was working closely with the uh, Ontario Farming Association as well, how many people didn't realize their responsibility sitting on a board? I mean, they were flattered to be invited, you know, okay, who's gonna run for a board position? We're short two people, you know, your hand goes up, you're flattered to be on the board, but they didn't think enough about what that really means. You're responsible to keep this afloat. You're responsible to make it successful. Uh, you're responsible to steer it in the right direction. And um, when we rolled this program out, uh, we actually kicked it off at the Ontario Farming, uh, the OFA convention. And there were about 800 people in the room and um, Senator Rob Black got up and said, oh my gosh, like is that, that's such a gap in rural, you know, he was speaking rural Ontario, but he said, it's such a gap that we haven't taken care of our rural leaders. 
in this regard. And now they're tasked with running these companies or these associations without the education behind them. So it was timely, you know, it was really timely for that audience, I think, to roll out a program like this. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think too, even just not so much the rollout, but like the advertisement and the awareness of it. I think that that's something, um, especially now that has to be considered and making sure that people know that these programs are available, um, the importance of them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like you said, lots of the times people who are applying or accept positions on boards or even members of exec or subcommittees within different organizations, yeah. it's not very well known what that truly entails. And I think the piece that you had shared about um, the clear and concise language and communication in what each role actually consists of moving forward and even to like promoting that long before people begin to just volunteer their time um, is something that gets really overlooked. Um, and then yes, yeah, without this education, they're, you know, taking on maybe more than they're comfortable with or that they're okay to do. and. Yeah, it's definitely probably a shock to the system for a lot of individuals who aren't aware of what. Yeah. what I, I do. Um, I do some volunteer recruitment for not for profits to help them find good people. And I was talking to the executive director of one, you know, fairly large not for profit. And he was saying, oh, it's just great because the board members are now going to help out with that. He was sort of relaying all of the management type work the board members were now going to do to help out. And yet I was wearing my governance hat as well. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, right? They're completely crossing into management's work. And there's probably a marketing person and a communication person and a fundraising person who's going to be going, what's happening? They're, they're in my job. You know, and then the uncertainty that comes with that, because once you have board of, boards of directors doing your job or helping you with your job, then you start to fear you won't have your job. So is so important to stay on the other side of the fence and, and remain. But of course I couldn't say anything because I wasn't wearing my governance hat. I was, <laughs> I was wearing my volunteer hat. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, exactly. Like recognizing when the line is being crossed, but just kind of recognizing it in like a non. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the poll questions that you provided uh, were significantly applicable to the different types of situations that so many people face when they're in an executive or um, board member position. Um, are these critical thinking scenarios, are they incorporated heavily throughout the eight different modules? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all, of the, all the polls that I pulled from, you know, are that sort of topic and that very, uh, you know, is, is there a lot of, there's, is there academic reading? Absolutely. I mean, you're going to read the Hadbury report, you're going to, the Surveillance Oxley report, which is where the U.S. government said after the last big recession, that's it. You know, boards of directors have to have reform governance as it's known now, and it's law in the U.S. after what happened with Enron and some of those other companies. So will you have academic reading to do? Absolutely. Um, not all of it really light, but there's also case studies and there's real life applicable pieces um, that'll make it much more real and bring it to, to life. Uh, so I think it's a really nice blend of adult learning principles throughout. Yeah, yeah, and like applying all of these important themes and these important key, you know, points and takeaways into the actual setting where you can apply them um, in a real life setting and making it a little bit more real because I feel like especially in those positions you don't really want to you know step on any toes or anything but like just to politely and accurately kind of navigate those situations and conflicts um, mm -hmm. is really important. Um, I could be wrong on this um, so the eight modules um, they're each uh, available individually um, total when they're all together if someone wanted to do the entire program that is the 295 dollars for the certificate it, yes. it's 295 per module 295 oh. per module so that is correct the the, um, the um, person that's done the math on this that is correct let me just see the, without questioning the value of the product at the price you've established at that level i suspect it would be out of reach for small boards with limited financial capacity in most rural communities 
um, one of the, I mean, any association would be able to use that as a tax deduction. Where it gets trickier is when you're doing it as an individual. That's a little trickier. And we are applying um, to have the ability to offer tax receipts to individuals. But any association or organization could use it as an expense. Awesome. So it would be a write-off for them. In, an acceptable write-off, absolutely. And just to give you an idea, um, and, and certainly not, I'm not responsible for pricing, so I won't even begin to justify the amount of work that went into building a course like this. However, um, I believe the ICD program is about 15,000 to do, and charter directors is about 11,000, and I think professional director, the full proder, is around eight, eight or nine, if I remember. So rural leadership is um, a much more um, price positive as far as director education goes than, than the, the bigger three, which was one of our goals in pricing it the way we did. I would like to once again, thank you so much, Vicki, for sharing your time with us today and telling us about the program um, and the ins and outs and what it entails and the benefits. Um, and I was just wondering, would you have any final remarks before we close up for the afternoon? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I wanna thank you for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed um, having the opportunity to, to do this. You know, my, before I came to Governance Solutions, I was working in the um, rural area. And um, so this uh, fits really nicely with what I, what I did previous to this new role. So um, thanks for letting me come in and talk about it. If you have any questions going forward, Nicole, send them to me, I'd be happy to answer it. And um, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much again for coming. And thank you everyone in the audience for attending and participating. Uh, it was greatly appreciated, especially on those poll questions. It was great to see, you know, how the different opinions varied.